Happy Sabbath. God is good all the time. And because of Him, you are here. Because of His grace, not by work. Today is October 21st. It's a very commemorable date. Am I talking to yes. seven Adventists yeah. here? Yeah. Yeah. In 1844, in the very day, people were, uh, were, people were anticipated such a great event. William Miller and those who supported him, they were so thrilled. They are so excited to see the second coming of Jesus Christ. They understood clearly Daniel 8.14. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, and then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Today, we're living in 2017. Imagine, just think about the difference in age. And we're still here. Why? We had a study. We had a study in this church that God is delaying His coming, not because He is busy with something else, but because we are not ready to receive Him yet. And because of His mercy, He postponing His coming and give us another chance, another chance. Bible very clear, God does not want anyone to perish, but all come and be saved. I want you to think about that. It might be the you, or maybe the I am the reason why he is not here since 1844. And then she makes very clear statement that if church would be ready, Jesus would come in few years. But apparently, church was not ready at that time. Church is not ready even now. But do you know one more thing? No matter if you're ready or not, he is coming. There's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. So, we talked to you uh, last study when I was here two weeks ago about the commitment that we're making and the priority that we're setting up. We've learned that we cannot have two priorities at the same time. You cannot serve two masters. At least 624 Matthew, the, Jesus Christ very clearly made this statement. You cannot serve two masters or one or another. Priorities about Anything else that surrounds you has to be seek ye first kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else. What falls in that everything else? Everything. I know it's too general, but that's what it is. Everything else would be added unto you. I'd like today to take a time, talk to you about with you and study about our Lord as a consuming fire. Fire, the God used sometimes to punish the wicked. And at the same time, he's using the fire to show his approval to things. He burn, he comes down with a fire, fire comes down from heaven and consume the offerings. And same fire destroy the city, kills people. Peter, Make a very clear statement. The God will not bring water anymore, flood upon this earth. But the same world keeps, uh, God is keeping with the same word, this world, for the day of judgment, not by flood, by by fire. Second Peter chapter 3. My dear brothers and sisters, today we're going to study two main, main scriptures. The first is taken from Leviticus chapter 10. And second one would, would be First Chronicle chapter 21. Leviticus chapter 10 talks about a tragedy that was, was happening in the, in the life of Israel, especially in the life of Aaron and his family. And not only, an entire Israel was shocked by being witness to those things that God allowed to happen. So, before we go there, I wanted to tell you one more thing. That w without any exceptions, every 
men and women in this room, little or grown up, we are architect of our own fortune. The quote that I'm going to read from Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene, page 28, paragraph 2, every man is an architect of his own fortune. While parents are responsible for the stamps of character as well as for the education and training of their sons and daughters, it is still true that our position and Usefulness in a world depend to a great degree upon our own course of action. Daniel and his companion enjoy the benefits of correct training and education in early life, but these advantages alone would not have made them what they were. The time came when they must act for themselves, when their future depended upon their own course. Then they decided to be through to the lesson given them in their childhood. So we have been, we've been taught by parents, but we come to this point in our life that we have to make our own choices, our own decisions. Today we study in Sabbath school a lot about choices. The, the God created us uh, independent um, yeah, agencies that we can make our own mind and follow or not. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 30, you'll find a very unique uh, advice that God is giving through Moses. Choose this day. I offer you life and death. Choose life. Why should you die? So, uh, Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10 uh, brings a tragedy, tragedy, horrible tragedy that was happening and from verse 1, I, I am reading verse 1, 10, 1. And Naed, the Sap, and Ibahu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offer a strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them and they died before the Lord. What is strange fire? The problem was, let's go from uh, chapter 8, chapter 8, Leviticus chapter 8. The God ordained them as a priest. There was a priest ordination in chapter 8. He explained how the Aaron should be, his clothes should be. He anointed the tabernacle and Aaron and clothing Aaron's son. Everything was done step by step. The, after that, the consecration offering was made. So they were strictly dedicated for this service. And uh, to the end of this chapter, Aaron uh, anointing Aaron, his sons, and their garments. Everything was done. If you go to chapter 9, inauguration of the tabernacle, the way how they worship, the tabernacle was inaugurated. The sin of offering was uh, for the priest, and the burnt offering for the priest, the offering for the people, everything that in chapter 9, uh, 8 and 9. So they knew very clear what was the requirements. And the uh, very sad part, if you continue reading, they've been intoxicated. They did not keep the fire on because the, um, the incense that were presented before the Lord represented the Christ, His mediation, His, His grace. So it never goes off. So it has to be always on. But they, not for God, they just could do it because of the physical stage, uh, the way how they were. So they, they put in some strange fire. And for that, immediately God punished them. Never was such a thing in Israel. Same fire that come and cons came and consumed that burnt offering. Same fire, kill this man. How about that? Same God. Sometimes we misinterpret. We say, no, God is too good to do this to his people. Oh, no, he is. He is the jealous God. He is a just God. He is not just to pamper and patch you and say, okay, you couldn't do this, but you might do something else better. Or next time, there are cross li the line that we cross. And after that, there is no mercy. There is no solution for any anyone. Uh, from the same book, I'm reading 
page 28, intemperance has cursed the world almost from the, its infancy. Noah's son, who was so debased by excessive use of wine, that the loss of all senses of the propriety and the curse which followed his sin has never been lifted from his descendants. It's, it's really, really important, brethren, how we treat our body, what we put in by eating, by drinking. We'll talk more about that. So, by showing contempt, continue reading same book. No, this is uh, This Day with God, page 123, paragraph 5. By showing contempt for the laws of nature, men and women lay the foundation for misery and suffering. I'm reading again. By showing contempt for the laws of nature, men and women lay the foundation of misery and suffering. Through the weakness of their moral power, they are abject slaves to passion. Some are digging their graves with their own teeth. Fork and knife, your own teeth, whatever the metaphor can be. It's not literal, but the way how you eat is going gonna, is gonna, to uh, come to you. The punishment must come. That's what it says. The continuing by this close the gate of the city of God against themselves by doing this for the penalty for, of violated laws must be realized. The punishment must come. Nadab and Abahu were men in holy office, but the use of wine, their minds become so clogged that they could not distinguish between good Sacred and common things. It's very important for us to have a sober mind. The police would not allow you to be on a highway if why plans. So why would you think that God would be okay for you to walk through this life and giving the examples to others by not having balanced mind? I have this statement here from uh, Manual for Canvassers. Page 24, I want you to hear this. Words well chosen. Do not, because you are wrong unbelievers, become careless in your words. For they are taking your measure. They're taking picture, they're listening, they're watching you. Study the instruction given to uh, Nadab and Abahu, the sons of Aaron. They Offer strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. Taking common fire, they placed it upon their censers. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. So, and uh, I'll just quote again Leviticus. And that they are, canvases should remember, and those who get in contact with un, unbeliever, remember that they are working with the Lord to save souls, and that they are bring, to bring no commonness or cheapness into His sacred service. Brother, when you speak in behalf of the Lord, you cannot use jokes or some gesture, some bad examples, because you misinterpret, misrepresent your Creator. Let the mind be filled with the pure, holy thoughts, and let the words be well chosen. Hinder not the success of your work by uttering light, careless words. It's very important. Because how you influence because the tragedy tragedy that happened in the family of Aaron was not just impacting him the whole uh, nation were astonished they were shocked the priests the high priests that they were admired they've been following now they they, they burn with, with the fire the God killed them the knowledge of the Lord how much do we have that knowledge many times we make mistakes because we don't know who God is I know it sounds like uh, we heard that many times, but it's for to me that when we have not clear knowledge about the Lord, it's like we're driving on the highway and we see this camera sign and we slow down because we know there is a camera or you have this app on your phone, maybe Waze, whatever they have now. So you see where the police stay and so forth. This is not the same what we have to have knowledge about God. To know where camera is, you might know it, okay? You might know it. But uh, 
It's not just not to make mistakes, not to be punished when you have a relationship with the Lord. You have to know who God is, how much He cares for you, and what is He expecting from you. So the knowledge of God, lift him up, page 119. The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea, Isaiah 11, 1 quoted. But a failure to study and obey the God's word has brought confusion into the world. Men have left the guardianship of Christ for the guardianship of a great rebel, the prince of darkness. Strange fire has been mingled with the sacred. The accumulation of things to lust and ambition has brought upon the world the judgment of heaven. Men, men's in the, in, uh, Sometimes things happen in the nature, okay? And the scientists of modern days are explaining, well, this is because of global warming. Have you heard that? Well, this is because of that. Do you believe that too? I'm not diminishing the work of the scientists. I'm not saying you don't have to kind of refer to them at all. But we do know the grace, God lifting up His grace gradually from this earth and calamity are increasing more and more so that's what it is because man has their own interpretation when the noah uh, prepared the ark for um for the animals and himself and his family to save their lives the animals migrate in the ark and the people were shocked as well. Bach and Prophet says the scientists at that time uh, made some research and they come up with this thought. No, nothing wrong. It's just the migration. Nothing wrong. And people kind of calm down. They calm down the people. So the same thing today. It's a global warming. It's not the science that Jesus is coming. It's a global warming or something else. When in difficulty philosophers and men of science try to satisfy there are minds without appealing to God. I'm reading from Lift Him Up, page 119. They ventilate their philosophy in regard to the heavens and earth according to the plagues, pestilence, epidemics, earthquakes, and famines by their question science, questions relating to creation and providence they attempt to solve this saying, this is the law of nature. Brethren, we have this book. And here is everything. Amen. If you want to know details, study book of Revelation. If you want to read Matthew uh, chapter, uh, chapter 24 or Luke chapter 21, it's just description of our, our uh, days where we are. It's just headlines from all the newspapers that you can only imagine. It's here. It's here in this specifically in these two, in these two chapters. Christ triumph on page one fifty one, paragraph four. Wherever the will of God is violated by nations or by individuals, a day of retribution comes. No matter if the whole country or just you. Many set aside the wisdom of God and prefer a wisdom of worldly people and adopt some human inventions or device. Christ triumphal, page 151. Lift him up back again to the same book, page 119, paragraph 5. For disobedience has closed the door to vast amount of knowledge that might have been gained to the word of God. Had men been obedient, they would have understood the plan of God's government. This is the problem. We are not study. The heavenly world would have opened its chambers of grace and glory for exploration. In form, in speech, in song, human beings would have been altogether superior to what they are now. We are behind. We are failing. We have Fs. The ministry of redemption, the incarnation of Christ, His atoning sacrifice would not be vague in our minds. They would be not only better understood, but altogether more highly appreciated. Study, study, give yourself a time, dedicate yourself, 
make it devotional and study this. Failure to study, continue reading the same book, failure to study God's word in the great cause of mental weakness, sorry, word is the great cause of mental weakness and inefficiency. How about that? Doesn't say that you have to go and watch some scientist, some programs on YouTube or read the book about this invention or so. Study the Bible. Because otherwise it's gonna be you are gonna have a mental weakness and an inefficiency. Uh, the understanding adapts itself to the comprehension of the things which with which it is familiar. And in this devotion to finite things, it is a weakened, its power, its power is contracted, and after time it becomes unable to expand. So Psalm 119 05, 119, 105, the word is the lamp unto my feet and the light to my paths. We're going to move now to book Patrick and Prophets. Patrick and Prophets go back to the story of um, Sons of Aaron. Page 360, Patrick and Prophets. God designed, I believe you have this in your bulletin. Yes, on the back, very first paragraph. God designed to teach the people that they must approach him with a reverence and awe. We've learned that we have to have a knowledge. We have to give ourselves the time to, to the book and study the Bible now. And in his own appointed manner, he cannot accept what? Partial, Partial obedience. It was not enough that in this solemn season of worship, nearly everything was done as he had direct. Nearly. Mark, just mark these words. God had pronounce a curse upon those who depart from his commandments and put no difference between common and holy things. I believe we as a people guilty the most of these things because we mingle, we put together, we don't see the difference between one and another. We talk about God and his business like a, like a business, like common business. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil that put dark that put darkness for light and light for darkness. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. They have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word that. Holy One of Israel, Isaiah 5, 20 and 24 reference. And here, ne next sentence. Let no one deceive himself with the belief that a part of God's commandments are not essential. Or that he will accept the substitute for that which he has required. Do you understand the word substitute? Something instead. You can substitute someone in some areas, but not everywhere. So, in your own salvation, there is no substitutes. In man, if man choose any other path that, than that of strict obedience, they will find the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 14, 12. Why was such a strict Command was given to Moses, uh, by Moses to Aaron, not to cry, not to rip his clothes, not to take any cover, uncover his head. What do you think? This is another problem in our, in our lives when we have our children, our friends, buddies, that we kind of overlook things that have done by them just because we are in good relationship. We cannot go against it. So Moses did command and Aaron was following. Uncover not your head, neither rent. I'm reading from Leviticus chapter 10. Neither rent your clothes, lest ye die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. The great leader reminded his brother of the words of God. I will be sanctified. In them that come high by me, and before all the people I will be glorified. Aaron was silent. 
the death of his son, cut down without warning, in so terrible a sin, a sin which he now saw to be the result of his own neglect of duty, wrong the father's heart with anguish, but he gave his feelings no expression. By no manifestation of grief must he seem to sympathize with sin. The congregation must not be led to murmur against God. Very tough for him was, and he realized there was part of his mistake. Absolutely, absolutely. The continue reading, page 361, the Lord would teach his people to acknowledge the justice of his correction that other may fear. So, it was done for some to teach others. The divine rebuke is upon that false sympathy for the sinners which endeavors to excuse his sin. It is the effect of sin to deaden the moral moral perceptions so that the wrongdoers does not realize the enormity of aggression. So that's how Satan is trying to play this trick with us. On the very front of your uh, bulletin, the very front page, we have this statement from Christ triumphant as well. God's people today have far greater light than had ancient Israel. They have not only the increased light that has been shining upon them, but the instruction given by God to Moses to be given to the people. God specified the difference between the sacred and common and declared that this difference must be strictly, strictly obeyed. Observe. Nathan and Abahu have never have committed that fatal sin had they not first become partially intoxicated. You agree on that? That's what it says. But the intemperance were disqualified for the holy office. Their mind became confused and their moral perception dulled so that they could not discern the difference between the sacred and common. What happened today in our modern time? I'm taking this quote from Abraham Prophets, page 362. The same obligation rests upon the every followers of Christ. The Apostle Peter says, Ye are chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people. 1 Peter 2.9 we are required by God to preserve every power in the best possible condition that we may render acceptable service to our Creator. No excuse. First Peter 2.9 No excuse. First Corinthians 6.19.20 says, Know you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are brought, bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We must bring our religion to the Bible standard. We must not place ourselves where we claim wisdom to overcome or reject God's words at, ple at pleasure. Never let the world think that the Christian and the world are the same in mind and judgment. We are not. We are not. I'm sorry, but many times we are not proving that by our life. We say we are just kind of giving the impression that we are just another denomination. No, we are not. I'm not. I know it's kind of a little bit sounds proud that we are chosen generation because the light that entrusted to us, no one else has it. Or those who have it, they fail to keep it. So, this church uphold the high standard. Continuing, there is a line drawn between the eternal God and the church on one side and the world on another. There is no unity between two. One chooses the way of the Lord, the other the ways of Satan. There will always be found a necessity to contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. This is the word of God. And uh, 
Christ Triumphal, page 121. Those who today murmur against God-appointed agency, weakening the confidence of the people in them, are doing the same work as the children of Israel did. In other words, when we're speaking bad about some minister, some those who are in charge, that's what it is. The Lord hears every murmuring words. He hears every word that detract from the influence of those whom he is using to proclaim the truth that is to prepare a people to stand in the last days. Uh, I'm, it's taking from manuscript early, manuscript 10, 1903. Or Christ Triumphal 121, 20, six. That was about these two people mainly in Aaron, how he reacted. The, the, uh, the, the temple, not the temple, the, uh, the congregation was shaken by this. Year passed. Year passed. Time passed. What happened? What changes have happened in the people of Israel? I'm reading from Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 26. Ezekiel 22, 26. Uh, it was when uh, Israel was in exile and um, the, the Jerusalem was not destroyed yet. Ezekiel speaks in God's behalf. Her priests have violated my law and profaned my holy thing. They have not distinguished between the holy and unholy, nor have they made known the difference between the clean and unclean and clean. And they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbath, so that I am not, I am profaned among them. Way later, it's Ezekiel 22, 26. Way later, way later, it still was there. There's nothing, <coughs> nothing, nothing changed, or it was not big change, I would say. I'd like you to go with me now in book of First Chronicles, chapter 21. First Chronicles, chapter 21. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel, and David said to Joab, and to rulers of people, go number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring number of them to me that I may know. Was it good? Sometimes you need to know what you have, how much is available for you. What was wrong with it? Why not? There is a great truth behind it. Why did God say to not number people of Israel? Never. Absolutely, yes. Because God uh, was fighting for them. They don't need to rely on numbers or how well equipped their armies. Remember the Jehoshaphat when he put the singers ahead and was no any military strategy there. Because God was fighting for them. God, one angel destroyed 185,000 people in one night. God was the one who threw the rocks from the sky and killed those people who were against Joshua. And so I can go on and on and on. And you know that not less than I, that God is fighting for people when they completely trust Him. When people take something in their own hands, then they go down. So, Patrick and Prophets, page 746, the history of David afterwards. One of the most impressive testimony ever given to the dangers that threaten the soul from power of riches and worldly honor. Those things that are most eagerly desired. Few have ever, men, few have ever passed through, the, through the, an experience better adopted to prepare them for test, for enduring such a test. David had a chance to be a shepherd. He had a chance to be in Saul's house. He saw how he was selfish and self-centered guy. And finally, David reached the peak of his, I would say, career or so. He relaxed. He wanted to know how much he has available in his army. And says the last sentence of this uh, paragraph. And yet worldly success and honor so weakened the character of David that he was repeatedly overcome by the tempter. Shortly after that, when numbers were presented to David, God, God sent the prophet to, his name was Gad, to David. Verse 11, 
21.11. So, God came to David and said unto him, Thus said the Lord, Choose thee either three years' famine or three months to be destroyed before the, thy foes, wa foes, while the, the sword of the thine enemies overtake thee, or else three days the sword of the Lord, even the pestilence in the land, that the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the coasts of Israel. Now therefore advise thyself uh, what word I shall bring against to him, to him that sent me. I mean, I don't know what to say about that. Have you ever been offered what spanking you want to take? <laughs> Some parents do that. They offer options. And this time David had three options. I'm curious, what did he choose? Verse 13. And David said to God, I'm in a great strait. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord. For very great are his mercies. What did God choose for him? Look what God chose for him. So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel. And there fell of Israel 70,000 men. When you fail and you lose something, is bad, no? But when someone is falling or losing or suffering because of you, it's worse, no? 70,000 people because of David's mistakes, huh? Just go back and remember how, how many people suffer because of your negligence or your mistake. And how do you feel? Well, well, I don't know. I just walk away. Yes, that was a very important, a very important experience for David. So, the king answered, I'm in a great strait. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord. And God pointed him a place where to build the altar and bring a sacrifice. It happened there was not in the it was not the king's property, it was someone else. Verse 23, and he went there. And the Lord said unto David, Take it to thee, because he said, May I, may I buy from the, this piece of land to build the the uh, the this altar for a sacrifice. And uh, that honest man, godly man, I would say, that's what the Bible says. And the Lord said unto thee, Take it to thee, and let my Lord the King do what which is good in his eye. The law I give you the oxen also for burnt offering, and the threshing instruments for the wood, and the wheat for the meat offering. I gave it all. He was a very generous man. No? He realized the, the trouble, the problem that the whole Israel are going through and he wanted to help King. was nothing wrong from his side. I believe he did as we all should do when nation in, is in trouble. What was the answer? Did, 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 did David take it? Was it too much or what? Let's read. And David said to God, I am in grace straight. Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. That one. No. 24. Verse 24. And King David said to Ornan, Nay, but I will verily buy it for thee for the full price, for I will not take that which is in thine, is thine for the Lord, nor offer, uh, offer burnt offering without the cost. Cheap. Sacrifice. Ministry that costs nothing, accomplish nothing, John Henry Jowett said. We like discounts, we like sales, we like gifts. Nothing wrong with that. When when it comes to the your salvation, there is no, no gift, no discount, no gifts. <coughs> gift is given to you. But you have to be thankful. Spirit Prophet says, Parham Prophets, 
The destroying angel had stated his course outside Jerusalem. He stood upon the Mount Moriah in the threshing floor of Orn and Jebusite. The wreck by the prophet David went to the mountain and there built an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offering and peace offering and called upon the Lord. And he answered him from heaven by fire and uh, upon the altar of burnt offering. So the Lord was entreated for the land and the plague was stayed from Israel. There, that very place was a very unique place. The Parchan prophets and Bible mention way back in Genesis about that place. Same one, three times in the Bible. Same one that David brought the sacrifice was pointed to whom? Help me out here. In Genesis, I got already a clue. I believe chapter 12. When uh, Abraham was about to bring his son, and there was a... Abraham desperately was looking for signs, and nothing was there. And one time he saw the, the light coming and radiated a point straight to that. That was the same place. The same place that Abraham was about to bring Isaac for sacrifice for sacrifice okay. and the third one is the same place where we're reading now the same spot the temple of solomon was erected started with abraham continue with david and finishes with the abraham with, with the solomon with the solomon you can find this in Pachin and Prophets, page 748. This spot memorable as the place where Abraham had built the altar to offer his son. And now, hallowed by his great deliverance, was afterward chosen as the site of the temple erected by Solomon. The Bible has so much coherence. God never make a mistake. Jump here and there, just random. No, God has an order and he wants uh, people to honor that place. My dear brothers and sisters, our life is in our, we are, we are, our destiny is in our own hands. What, the way how we choose our directions, that's where we're going to end up. The gift of eternal life has been placed within the reach to, of every son and daughter of Abraham. Eternal life. I'm reading from volume 3, page 255. Eternal life is of infinite value and will cost us all that we have. I was shown that we do not place a proper estimate upon eternal thing. It, uh, everything worth possessing, even in this world, must be secured by effort and sometimes by most painful sacrifice. And this is merely to obtain a perishable treasure. Shall we be less willing to endure conflict and toil and to make earnest effort and great sacrifice to obtain treasure which is of infinite value and of life which will measure with that of that infinite? Can heaven cost us too much? Is <coughs> answer is no, no. It will cost us an effort to secure eternal life absolutely our effort our self-denial our perseverance must be proportional to the infinite value of the object of which we are in pursuit when i'm going to buy a car i'm looking the value okay i go through kbb or see okay what mileage is okay i see is it worth it for me to invest that much or should i look for something else so when you come to your salvation my dear brother and sister there is a the word anything which you do absolutely yes yes and yes malachi chapter 1 verses 7 through 14 we come to the last part of our study here malachi chapter 1 verses 7 through 14 Having that in mind that heaven cost everything what we have, Malachi, way further than Moses, Aaron, Aaron, and David. Verse 7, He offered polluted bread upon mine altar, and he say, Wherein have we polluted thee? In that he say, The table of the Lord is contemptible. And if we offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? 
And if he offer the lame and sick, it is not evil. If you want to know more details about the offerings, just go to book of Leviticus and read all the chapters from 1 through 10. And you will be surprised uh, how uh, strictly God was in his instruction. Uh, back to verse 8. Offer it now unto the governor. Will he be pleased with thee or accept by thy person? Said the Lord of hosts. But he hath it, and that profaneth it. In that he say, the table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit of even his meat is contemptible. Verse 14, But cursed be the deceiver, which had in his flock a male, and wooeth, and sacrificed unto the Lord a corrupt thing. For I am a great king, said the God, the Lord of hosts, and my name is Dreadful. Dreadful among the hidden. I want us to break down on, to the, toward the conclusion. What is the meaning? What, what, how much? In what sense we can bring a strange fire or bring a cheap sacrifice? That we can see a little bit deeper. No, we say, oh no, I am not a, I'm not a priest. I'm, I'm kind of free from this. No, you are not. Number one, when we operate in human effort instead of divine power, you are trying to bring a strange fire when you trust in God. That is pride and we are often guilty of acting, living like we do, do not need God or His help. We, I know how to do it. I know. I, I can manage. So that's number one. Polluted sacrifice or strange fire when you're trying to mingle or mix together. Number two, when we live a kind of life instead of committed lives no commitment or lack of commitment when you run without with the world live like the world talk walk and act like the world dress like the world seek our entertainment in the world and many other things we are offering god brass instead of gold when we have the same pursuits brother I ask you this question, what is for you a, a strange fire? This is the strange fire. Because you kind of trying to appease God and not to lose this world advantages as well. Number three. When we live in compromise instead of total commitment. When we do less than our best for the Lord. We are compromising His standard of... Um, excellence and we are guilty of giving him brass for gold we have to really realize when we come here we should not come unless we fill up with the with the spirit and speak Amen. in his behalf Amen. otherwise our destiny would be just native and above nothing less number four when we are satisfied with a substitute instead of the genuine one original one we accept the substitutes this world offers in place of god's presence and power in our church we're living in compromising compromised life and that is giving god brass for gold number five when we offer up excuses instead of humble obedience when we say well i would do this or that but I'm busy. I have no time to do this. I have no time for study. I have no time for Tuesday night prayer meeting because I have plenty of schedules. I have family. And brethren, list can go on and on and on, but it's very serious what I'm reading now. When we try to keep appearance instead of humbling ourselves before the Lord in repentance, appearance. When I'm trying to look good, present it myself. When we know we are not where the Lord wants us to be with Him. And we pretend all is well. We're giving Him brass for gold. Does God really have your best? Question. I want to conclude.
with um, I have unknown after. I found this and decided to share with you. I asked God to take my to take away my pride. And God says no. He said it was not for him to take away, but for me to give it up. I asked God to make my handicapped child whole, and God says no. He said his spirit her spirit was whole, her body was only temporary. I asked God to grow me patience, and God said no. He said patience is byproduct of tribulation. It is not granted, it's earned. I asked God to give me happiness, and God said no. He said, he gives me blessing, happiness up to me. I asked God to share, to spare me pain, and God said no. His suffering drones you apart from worldly cares and bring you closer. I asked God to make my spirit grow, and God says no. He said, I must grow on my own, but... He will prune me to make me fruitful. I ask for all things that I might enjoy life. And God says, no. He said, I will give you life that you may enjoy all things. Amen. I ask God to help me love others as much as He loves me. And God says, oh, finally, you have the idea. I'd like to conclude with the Hebrew chapter, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. That would be our closing verse for today. Hebrews chapter 12. Verses 28 and 29. Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with a reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. May God bless you all. Amen.